welcome everybody to this important event, um, which is to commemorate the 40 years of the response to HIV, which has been hosted by the Slovenian presidency and organized by UNAIDS AIDS Fund. And we have a distinguished panel that will be joining us today. Um, and I want to thank um, everybody for making the time to, to join us. Um, from, um, from, we have the pleasure to have um, Commissioner Uplanger, Commissioner Dali. Um, we also have, um, with joining us on the panel, um, um, Ephraim Gomez, um, Chief of Staff at UNAIDS, Diane Stewart, Deputy Director um, of External Relations from the Global Fund, Sibon Gile, um, Tasha, Tasha Lana um, from the Treatment Action Campaign, Evelyn Regner, Martin Seychelles, um, Joyce Uma, and we will have a closing statement from the Director General, Ambassador Igor um, Yukit Yuchiv. Um, you've all seen the agenda, um, and just a reminder that um, the importance of this event is that we've had 40 years of responding to AIDS and many, and many commitments um, to ending AIDS. We've been side, we, all of us have been um, very much um, um, affected by COVID and the COVID response over the last 18 months. And the importance of this event is to remember that AIDS isn't over and there's still a long way to go to ensuring that um, the, the commitments and the commitments that have been made internationally and by the European Union and the Parliament to contributing to ending AIDS is very much important. So we very much welcome your participation in this event. I'll be co, my name is Anton Ophiel Kerr, I'm the Director of Equal International, and we've been supporting UNAIDS and AIDS funds and organizing this event. And I have a co-facilitator um, who will be, um, who'll be helping me, particularly when we are facilitating the panel, dis the, the panel discussion, um, Iwatutu, who will be joining us um, shortly. So we're going to start this event with um, a, um, a, a, a video um, address, um, which I'd like to hand over to our UNH colleagues who will um, start that for us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be able to greet you at this important high level meeting in remembrance of 40 years of AIDS epidemic. AIDS continues to be major health crisis despite the remarkable progress in the past 40 years. AIDS still claims lives on a daily basis. In 2020, nearly 38 million people were living with HIV, of which more than 10 million did not have access to adequate treatment. Nearly 700,000 people died from AIDS-related illnesses, and 1.5 million people became newly infected. This is far above the 2020 target of less than 500,000 new infections globally. Most vulnerable populations still lack meaningful access or to HIV prevention services, treatment and care. From a fatal disease, AIDS has become a chronic condition, but the progress is not equal across the globe. Gender inequality, sexual and gender-based violence, Stigma and discrimination are obstructing adequate response in many parts of the world. The COVID-19 pandemic is posing traditional challenges, while fewer people living with HIV have been diagnosed and fewer have started treatment. While people living with HIV have more severe outcomes, countries with the highest burden of HIV have the lowest COVID-19 vaccine coverage. We therefore urgently need to prioritize actions that will reduce AIDS-related inequalities and disparities that are obstructing adequate HIV response, as well as COVID-19 and future pandemics response. Slovenia is supporting the strong European Union in the context of global health, with active involvement of relevant stakeholders, including civil society. We are committed to strategic reinforcement of health systems globally, especially in the field of pandemic preparedness and response, as well as a global solidarity in the response to future threats. We cannot afford to leave anyone behind. 
I sincerely hope that today's debate will lead to reaffirm our com commitments and reinforce joint actions to eliminate AIDS as a global epidemic. Thank you. That was a, um, a video introduction by the Minister of Health for Slovenia. Um, <clears throat> and we want to, uh, again, thank the um, presidency of Slovenia for hosting this event. We, as a, to, to help us all get up to speed and remind us of um, the progress that's been made on HIV and also the path that we still have to tread to end AIDS, um, we are going to look at a short video from UNAIDS, which does a summary of 40 years of the response. Thank you very much. Um, to start us off, we've, we're honoured to have Helena Dali, EU Commissioner for Equality, joining us for this event. Um, um, Commissioner Dali, can I hand over to you for your, um, in, your keynote address? Do we have Commissioner Dali there? No. We'll just give the commissioner a, a minute or two to see if they can they connect to us. And maybe whilst we're waiting, we have a video Please. statement. Apologies, Anton. If we can move to the video statement by Commissioner Urpilainen and uh, MEP Regner will be a few minutes delayed. Okay. 
So we've got a video statement by Commissioner for International Partners, um, um, Jutta Upelainen. Um, our UNAID colleagues, would you like to um, show us that statement? Today, people with HIV can live long, fulfilling lives. The medical advances of the last 40 years are truly impressive. We have come a long way in terms of education and reducing stigma. But a lot remains to be done. The EU is fully committed to ending AIDS by 2030. We must tackle inequalities, which the pandemic has deepened. We must prioritize those who are not yet accessing life-saving HIV services, in particular girls and young women. EU has contributed 2.6 billion euros to the fight against HIV and AIDS. We will continue our support in the years ahead. We need to tackle HIV on all fronts and together. We have to improve reproductive education and increasing access to contraceptives. We need to address discrimination and ensure equitable access to treatment. We must bring an end to the COVID pandemic and strengthen entire health systems on the long term. For example, we have launched a Team Europe initiative to boost pharmaceutical manufacturing in Africa for Africa. This initiative will contribute to our efforts to tackle the HIV pandemic too. Friends, we must work together. On World AIDS Day, we can celebrate how far we have come. But we must also renew our efforts and our vision in light of the lessons learned in the past two years. So let's work together to make real that in nine years' time, we can declare victory over AIDS. Thank you very much. In a moment, I'm going to be handing over to, to, um, to, to Commissioner um, Dali to give her keynote address. Whilst we're waiting, I just want to acknowledge that we've got um, um, a good amount of attendees. Um, I would like to encourage you to use the chat function in Zoom. I'm sure you're all used to um, using Zoom a lot these days to share any comments, but also any questions throughout the event. Um, um, after we've heard from Commissioner Dali, we will enter into a panel discussion. Um, and after that panel discussion, we'll be going through a round of discussions. Um, and then and then we'll be also, if there's time, we'll open the floor to questions. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to share, please do share them in the chat. Um, we have a hand up. Um, um, did you have a question? No, it was, I think someone practicing a hand. Um, can I check whether, whether um, we have um, Commissioner Daly with us yet? No. So what we're going to do is I'd like to introduce the panel um, that we have together with us. Um, we have Ifrem Gomez, who is the um, Chief of Staff at UNAIDS. Diane Stewart. Um, welcome, Diane. It's great to see you there. Um, who is the Di 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 um, Deputy Director of External Relations um, and Communications at the Global Fund. Um, Sibongile Chabalala, who is the Chairperson of the Treatment Action Pack. Action Campaign, Evan Regner, who's a member of the European Parliament, Martin Seychelles, who is the Director General for International Partnerships at the European Commission, and Joyce Boomer, who is a young HIV and SRH advocate, um, um, who, who is um, we are lucky to have with us. I'd also like to introduce <clears throat> my um, co my co convener, co, -fac co facilitator, who is Iwatulu um, Adewale. Um, Iwatulo, um, in a minute, uh, it'd be good for you to say, say hello. Um, and what we'll do is we'll probably go into, we're going to change the order and the flow of the day, and we'll probably go into um, the panel discussion. So if our panelists are happy 
and and ready. You're a little bit of we're a little bit of ahead of schedule because we'll come straight to you. Um, we've um, um, I'd like to hand over to Iwatu Iwatu, who will introduce herself, and then she's got a round of questions for you. And you'll see that um, um, we've got two rounds of questions, and then we'll see whether we have some time to open up to the floor. So Iwatutu, over to you. Thank you so much, Anto. It's such a great pleasure to be moderating this high level meeting on World Health Day. I often see what Health Day has a reminder that together we can beat this, a way to show support for people living with HIV and also a day to remember those who have died from AIDS-related illnesses. My first question will be going to Ephraim. Ephraim, 2021 has been a landmark year for the global AIDS response. It marks 40 years of the epidemic, 25 years of UNAIDS, and 20 years of the Global Fund. We have also concluded that the world did not achieve the 2020 targets. Can you explain why we missed them? What actions have been taken to get back on track to ending it as a public health threat by 2030? Well, thanks, uh, Iwatutu, and thank you all for um, <clears throat> who are contributing to this important discussion today. And I give a special shout out, of course, to our fellow activists who have joined us for the conversation, whether online or in the, or in the conversation in between us panelists. Uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with UNAIDS, we are the body of the joint program of the United Nations, marking 25 years. And we, are, um, we generate data for impact for their HIV response. We make uh, rights and voice effective for those most in need. And we also help to program many of the billions that are invested in the global HIV, um, in the global HIV response. But to answer to your question, I think it's useful for us to be reminded that one AIDS related death per minute is an emergency. And so, and it's, and all of the AIDS related deaths are avoidable and all of the new infections as well. It's just a question of uh, mustering the will uh, to, to beat it. And so the bad news or the concerning news is that unfortunately we're off track. And so we're not, we're not meeting the targets uh, that we've set ourselves to, to do uh, for this year, for 2020. And uh, their progr the progress that's been made is unfortunately uneven. The, but, uh, and there are some pockets here. Uh, we have what we term key populations, which is um, uh, LGBTIQ plus pe people, uh, sex workers also, um, drug injectors that uh, where these where the epidemic continues to grow, they make up 65% of the of the new infections. We also have a gendered epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa, and so uh, many adolescent girls and young women who contract HIV um, uh, in a way that should be completely avoidable. So the prevention agenda remains acute, uh, and we've not been able to be as successful as we should. Now, the good news, uh, and I should also say, of course, that COVID-19 has further compounded uh, some of this uh, concerning uh, figures that we have for the HIV fight. But the good news is, of course, that we have a way forward. Uh, we have a global AIDS strategy that was recently adopted for 22 to 26. Um, and we're kind of pride, proud of this, uh, of this uh, global AIDS strategy because whereas many theorize about the quality, we have set out to operationalize it. And so we've been bold enough to include, for instance, new targets, quantifiable targets on social determinants to help the AIDS response, HIV response, reach its ultimate goal of beating AIDS. And we also have, importantly, we have a political declaration that member states uh, in the UN adopted it in GA uh, earlier this year in June. And it's also a bold declaration. I would say that it's a, uh, having a negotiated document today in the UN of this nature with such progressive commitments is a feat. And it's largely owed to also EU leadership uh, and support in the negotiation. So, a uh, word of thanks also again for, for that uh, tremendous work and assistance that we had in pulling this through. But with these two instruments, we have our work cut out for us for the next years. And we know what we need to do uh, to reach the new 2025 targets. 
Thanks. Over to you. To, to. Yeah, thank you so much, Efren. Um, that's such a um, great discussion on um, some of the document, important documents like global strategy and the political declaration to get back to get us back on track in ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Putting this in mind, Simon Gele, you are the chairperson of the Treatment Action Campaign and a known activist for social justice and human rights. As a community member, what progress have you seen in your long years of experience working for the AIDS response? What challenges do you foresee in reaching the 2030 targets? Thank you, Iwaitutu. Uh, 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 um, and thank you for having me in this discussion and this important discussion. Um, as, as a community activist, what, uh, what progress I have, I have seen, um, there is a lot that has happened. One, we were able to fight stigma as much as there's still stigma, but the level of stigma and discrimination that people living with HIV are seeing on the ground, it has not like it was before, it has improved because now we are seeing more people uh, living with HIV understand what uh, is HIV and also how to deal with HIV and how to live longer with HIV. We have seen a, a number of people living with HIV living longer, which it's a, it's a great progress, especially for us as people living with HIV and those who are fighting for, for treatment on the ground. Uh, we have seen uh, treatment programs like treatment literacy and prevention programs uh, uh, doing well in the, in, the, in the past few years. But lately we have seen the decrease of those programs, which we really need uh, to improve on that. Uh, the previous speaker spoke about the young girls that are infected with HIV. Yes, we are seeing that a lot, but we don't have a, a, a positive way of responding to those issues because we still see a number of young people uh, being infected with HIV. But the challenges that we are still facing, especially as communities on the ground, the service delivery, it's the, the, the level of, of, of service delivery is declining instead of increasing. We are now seeing more people uh, leaving or not taking their treatment because of the challenges that we are seeing on the ground. For instance, I'm in Cape Town. Uh, we are doing facility monitoring in Cape Town. Yesterday, I visited one of the clinics uh, in, in Mitchell's Plain. That clinic, the, it's, it's so poor. Uh, the, the sewerage outside, the nurses cannot work. They, they've moved the clinic to the hall, community hall, which the community hall cannot be able to cater for, 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 for patients. I'm talking to you now. There are five clinics which are going to be closed in, in, in Cape Town, in Kyalicha and Mitchell's Plain because of poor services, because of infrastructure. So those are the issues that, or those are the issues that are, 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 are hindering us from having a progress in terms of reaching our targets uh, 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 as, 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 uh, uh, in the AIDS response. And also we have seen more young women and women are being affected by the issues of gender-based violence, issues of sexual reproductive health and rights. Uh, I'm talking to you now, there are a lot of challenges as much as some of the countries like South Africa, it's very progressive. Uh, we have progressive laws, but on the ground, things are not well. When you go to our Richita project, you will see that key populations are still not treated well in, 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 in facilities or in clinics. People, they still don't understand uh, LGBTI. Young women are still afraid to go to facilities because they will be challenged, they'll be asked questions, and they are unable to access contraceptives and sexual reproductive health uh, uh, services as they are supposed to, to do. But also uh, looking at the issues of funding, uh, in terms of funding HIV programs, we have seen a lot of decline and we have seen a lot of organizations that are working on AIDS, on AIDS response being closed down because due to funding. So those are the challenges that we are still facing and that I believe and we think that they must, they might hinder us from uh, reaching our targets. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Simukale. I can I can actually um, relate to those um, um, your experiences. I remember in the um, in twenty years back, they used to call us the HIV babies. 
It's such a discriminatory word they use for um, children, adolescents, and um, babies living with HIV. And it's been a long while since I get that, those type of words any, again. So I, I think um, there's a reduction in stigma, but there's still a lot to do because new drivers like inequality, power dynamics um, for, for um, amongst men and women are still playing a big role in the um, new HIV infections, particularly amongst young people, young women, and that of key population. My next question will be going to Evelyn, the European Parliament. Um, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on HIV and AIDS this year in support of the UN political declaration. Data shows that gender inequality increases the vulnerability of women and girls to HIV. As chair of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality, what are the roles the FIN committee play in addressing gender inequalities? Okay, should I repeat my question again, Evelyn? I'm not sure if Evelyn's with us, so perhaps um, you could go on to um, speak to Joyce. Okay, yes, Joyce is great. Um, Joyce, you are a young advocate for the rights of young people living with HIV. What has been your experience as a leader? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Joyce. And as a young woman leader yourself, uh, you will probably relate with uh, the experiences that I'm going to share as my experiences uh, has no much difference from that of other young women leaders. We have all very many challenges that um, we, we have had to encounter along this journey. And that question is really thought provoking. I remember when I started off um, my journey in advocacy at the age of 19, as a young girl living with HIV who wanted to do one thing, to eliminate stigma and discrimination towards young people living with HIV. But this has not been easy. In my early years in activism, I can say for lack of a better word, I was used um, for my story. People took advantage of me. I was only called for meetings when it was convenient for the organizers um, or when my story would fit the audience. And in some session, I was the token young person, sometimes even told what to say in these forums. But um, growing into a young woman leader has taken time. It has taken effort, commitment, and support from those around me. But I'm happy to share that this has been a success. Um, I have been mentored by other women in this field, and I am now glad to report that I am supporting others. I am currently co-leading the revision process of the positive learning publication, um, meeting the needs of learners living with HIV in schools. And this is a project that um, is spearheaded by UNESCO and uh, the Global Network of Young People Living with HIV, Y Plus Global. And I am working with a co-consultant who has been selected by UNESCO. And this sort of working relationship also has um, a mentorship aspect in it because I work with her as a co-consultant, but she's also my mentor. So I'm getting to learn on the job as well. And I am happy and I'm really glad that uh, high level institutions and partners like UNESCO and UNAIDS are recognizing the expertise that as young people living with HIV we are bringing to the table and that they can trust me with this huge task and they can trust Y Plus Global to lead this huge amount of work. And that is a step in the right direction. Um, I could say that uh, it's been a success, of course, because I am currently no longer working as an individual, but I am merging my efforts as an advocate, as an activist with other young leaders at the Global Network of Young People Living with HIV to improve the quality of life for young people living with HIV globally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. I can totally relate to what you have just um, talked about. And it's some of the things about meaningful youth engagement, you know, they only tell us to talk about um, our experiences only when it wants to fit the donor's um, um, agenda or, or the target of what the donor is expecting. That is when they invite young people in, but they don't invite us to design for implementation or for mentorship. And um, those are one of the challenges I can, I can totally Relate. So thank you so much for sharing that experience with us again. And my next question goes to Martin. The uh, commission. Uh, yes. I would just, sorry, we're going to adjust the flow a little bit, if that's okay. And um, just because um, we, we're adapting the program and we have Commissioner Daly with us. 
Um, and I just want to give her the opportunity to, to give her address. And um, she has limited time. And then we'll go back to the panel discussion, if that's okay. So okay, thank you everyone okay. for your flexibility and bearing with us. Um, um, Commissioner Dali, I just want to con confirm that you're there and online. Um, we really welcome your participation in this World AIDS Day event. Um, and I know that you're very passionate as the Commissioner for Equality around Equality. And also Malta has in many different spheres played a very important role in protecting the rights of marginalised groups. So um, over to you to, to um, share your address with us. Thank you. And can you hear me? We can. Good. Good afternoon. Every year on the 1st of December, we commemorate the, the World AIDS Day. We come together to show support for people living with HIV and to remember those who have died from an AIDS-related illness. World AIDS Day remains as relevant today as it ever was. It is a stark reminder that HIV is not behind us and that we need to continue to fight it. I'm thankful to the Slovenian presidency for organizing today's event together with UN AIDS and AIDS funds. And I'm delighted to represent the European Commission at this important event. Since the AIDS pandemic first hit more than 35 years ago, 33 million persons have died from AIDS-related illnesses. And almost 38 million people are still living with HIV in 2020. Combating HIV AIDS is a priority for the EU and we have invested significantly in HIV AIDS research. Under the previous framework program for research and innovation, the EU invested over 175 million euros in HIV AIDS research. In Horizon 2020, the uh, successor to the FP7, the Commission is continuing to support research to develop novel or improved tools against HIV. But a number of scientific challenges stand between us and an AIDS-free world. And discrimination and stigma against people with or thought to have HIV AIDS remain widespread. This year, we highlight the urgent need to end the inequalities that drive AIDS and other pandemics around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic and the spiraling social and economic crisis has restricted people's access to crucial sexual and reproductive health services, such as HIV programs. This, this risk undermining the goal to end AIDS by 2030. Tackling inequalities is crucial to end AIDS. We must place people's needs at the center of HIV programs. We know that inequalities are a key driver of the AIDS epidemic. Unequal power dynamics between men and women and the discrimination against minority groups increase people's vulnerability to HIV. Barriers to sexual and reproductive health services, as well as the social stigma associated with using those services, hinder adolescent girls and those belonging to minorities from making decisions about their own sexual and reproductive health. A lack of education, excuse me, a lack of education, just a second. I'm sorry about this. I'm seen to have lost the connection. Oh, okay, I'm back. Sorry. A lack of education and economic opportunities and insufficient or non-existent access to comprehensive sexuality education also increase vulnerability to HIV. This is why I am giving my all to build a union of equality. The gender and LGBTIQ equality strategies and the EU Roma strategic framework that I launched since the beginning of this mandate emphasize the need to ensure equal access to health for all. But this is clearly not enough. As stressed by the European Parliament, we need to invest in research and innovation for new gender sensitive centers of tools to prevent, diagnose, and treat HIV and AIDS and fight against HIV drug resistance. Most importantly, we need to work together to address the inequalities hampering the AIDS response. We need to listen 
to those living with HIV and invest in a community-led response in our fight against stigma and discrimination. For decades, affected communities have been driving the global HIV response forward. Community-led organizations are play playing a critical role during the COVID-19 pandemic, delivering HIV drugs and services directly to the people in greatest need. This community engagement must be at the core of our efforts to end AIDS by 2030 and to build a union of equality. To achieve this goal, the Commission is committed to open up policy and lawmaking and listen to the people it affects in all their diversity. For instance, the LGBTIQ equality strategy was developed in cooperation and consultation with member states, civil society, and other relevant stakeholders, both in terms of the issues it addresses and the type of actions it proposes. In September 2019, the Commission organized a public stakeholders consultation together with the Finnish Presidency of the Council of the European Union in the form of a high-level conference on advancing LGBTI equality in the EU for, from 2020 and beyond. To prepare for this conference, we worked closely with the main umbrella organizations and we tried to ensure that the voice of smaller national NGOs and activists is heard. Leading to the strategy's adoption, the Commission services held numerous bilateral consultations with the main LGBTIQ European associations, who are themselves in touch with their national members. We also published a, round, a roadmap to allow citizens and stakeholders to provide their feedback. This process provided us with a good understanding of the concerns of mem member states, civil society, and other stakeholders. Under the strategy, we will continue to encourage an open dialogue and consultation with civil society in law and policy making. For instance, in the framework of the Copenhagen 2021 World Pride and Euro Games, the Commission organized a session gathering representatives from the Fundamental Rights Agency, the Council of Europe, and LGBTIQ activists and human rights defenders. The event allowed for a discussion on how the EU, civil society, and other stakeholders can improve their cooperation to raise the diverse voices of the LGBTIQ community. We likewise work closely together with all relevant stakeholders to achieve progress in gender equality and implement the gender equality strategy. We team up in partnership with civil society and women's organizations, social partners, the private sector and academia. Tackling inequalities is central to ending AIDS as it will advance the human rights of people living with HIV, making societies better prepared to, be, to beat COVID-19 and other pandemics and support economic recovery and stability. Tackling inequalities will save millions of lives and benefits us all. We must act boldly to beat AIDS by 2030. I remain committed to tackle inequalities, protect the rights of everyone, and pay attention to the needs of disadvantaged and marginalized communities in the EU. We know what the inequalities that obstruct progress are, and we know how to tackle them. We must work together to end AIDS by 2030 here in the EU and beyond. I invite all of you today to rock the ribbon, to show your support to people living with HIV and their families. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Dali. You covered a, an extensive amount of, of information and commitments. And what really stands out is that policy leadership and commitments make a real difference to people's lives um, on the ground. Um, so they're not just words. We know that the implementation of policies and commitments really save lives and change lives. My um, co-facilitator, Iwatutu Adoele, is an exemplary example of a positive woman living in Nigeria who has been an advocate for, for young women, for people affected by HIV. And she's got a question for you, which I'm going to hand over to her to ask. 
Thank you so much, um, um, Anto. Um, Commissioner Daly, it's such an honor to have you here amongst us. And some of the um, three key words I, I have put down uh, in your speech is um, policy, investment, and equality. And this um, amazing sentence that you said in your speech, building a union of equality. I just want to ask this on behalf of young women. What are your objectives of your work regarding young women like me to make our voice out and empower us? Well, women uh, often often hold the dual role of breadwinners and, and carers and are among uh, the hardest hit by, by the, pan the COVID pandemic, for instance. So gender equality is a core value of the EU, a fundamental right and key principle of the European pillar of social rights. So it is a reflection of, of who we are. So it is also an essential condition for an innovative, competitive and thriving European economy. Our gender equality uh, strategy includes ambitious goals to tackle violence against women and stereotypes, push for gender equal economy and, and achieving gender balance in decision making and politics. So these actions and initiatives aim to advance gender equality and create the best environment for women and girls to thrive. We work together with a variety of stakeholders, activists, and communities to ensure that our actions integrate an intersectional approach. Most of all, we do not limit our intervention to the European Union alone, but make it a point to work internationally and support women and girls around the world. Commissioner Daly, thank you so much for making time to come and join this important event. Um, we really, it's been a pleasure to have you and to have your comments that I, um, I hope will stimulate our panel discussion, which we're going to continue with. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and the leadership that you're showing, particularly as the Commissioner for Equality. Thank you so much, Anto. So um, I just noticed that um, Evelyn is back. And I really appreciate that Evelyn is with us and knowing that she's on, on a mission. So I'm just going to quickly ask her this question. Evelyn, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on HIV and AIDS this year in support of the UN political declaration. This shows that gender inequality increases the vulnerability of women and girls to HIV. As chair of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality, what role could the FEM Committee play in addressing inequality, gender inequalities? Thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations to having this occasion to uh, debate uh, an issue that is so important. So the Committee of Gender Equality and Women's Rights is here to safeguard the right of all persons, regardless of age, sex, gender, race, disability, HIV status, and so on. So it's about talking about fundamental rights. And May, you were referring to it, 2021, we adopted a resolution on accelerating progress and tackling inequalities towards uh, ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, to say the full title. We worked on several commitments and calls, specifying that including men who have sex with men, transgender people, people who inject drugs, sex workers and their clients, and prisoners is key to the HIV response. So uh, what's in there, and so important to sum it up, scaling up investments in UNAIDS and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. So you have full support from the European Parliament to prioritize the fight against stigma and discrimination, sexual and gender-based violence, criminalization of same-sex relations and other punitive and discriminatory laws and policies in order to contribute to universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights access to quality education, including comprehensive sexuality education, equitable and affordable access to health care. So simply all those systems, when we look deeper in national jurisdictions, simply systems that exist, not only individuals, systems that make it so, uh, 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 that make it, uh, so difficult. 
So um, furthermore, the access to the labor market, the participation of affected communities in all spheres, spheres of public life. So uh, with this, referring the importance of PrEP to key populations as an efficient and 100% guaranteed method against HIV contraction, which must be accessible and fairly priced. So vulnerable and marginable, marginalized populations continue to be stigmatized, including through HIV and COVID-19 intersections, such as people living in poverty, homeless, refugees, migrants, sex workers, people who use drugs and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex persons. So anti-stigmatization work in all related areas. And as you see, I really uh, uh, was uh, referring right now to a quite large uh, group of people we have to look at. Some mentions in also in our SRHR report, the Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights report, of my colleague Fred Matic, who caused so many debates and is so important uh, because this is also a gender equality topic. So um, what we absolutely demand is to ensure universal access to quality, affordable and comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care and HIV services, information and commodities uh, for women. So all this is about eliminating gender inequalities and end all forms of violence and discrimination against women and girls, such as gender-based, sexual, domestic, and intimate partner violence, including in conflict, post-conflict and humanitarian settings. So I was enumerating quite, uh, uh, quite much and uh, uh, quite a lot there is to do, but when we are referring that more than one third of women around the world have experienced already physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner or sexual violence by a non-partner at uh, some time in their lives and more or less taking the whole picture so that in some regions in the world, women who have experienced physical and sexual intimate partner violence are 1.5 times more likely to get HIV than women who have not experienced such violence we see, I mean, there is really a lot to do. And we see that gender equality increases the vulnerability, vulnerability of women and girls uh, to HIV. So for me, as a thumb chair, I try to look at what it means for each of these women and girls. And as we know, the current pandemic is also an additional challenge uh, uh, to life of HIV uh, positive uh, women as well. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, one of the key um, key word that has been showing up right now is this investment, investments in the HIV response, particularly for women, for key populations. And it's so good to know your role uh, within the FEM committee to um, advancing the rights, well-being, and development of um, women and girls. I really want to sincerely appreciate you for that. I'll be going back to Martin. Um, Martin, the commission is highly committed to addressing the vulnerability of girls and women as reflected in its policies and action plans. Martin, how does the commission ensure that this, its policy address the realities we face on the ground? Thank you for the question. I mean, uh, Commissioner Dali mentioned the uh, EU gender equality strategy and the EU gender action plan, the third one, uh, covering the period 2021-2025. And uh, these provide us with a very ambitious gender policy framework uh, in which we place gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls at the very heart of our external policy agenda here in the EU. Um, we are very much committed to promote and to support uh, gender equality across all of our external actions, so to mainstream them. Um, and uh, the implementation of the Gender Action Plan is indeed now uh, very much at full speed. One of the key areas of engagement in the Gender Action Plan is the promotion of universal access to health. So in, in concrete terms, what this means is that through our EU action, we aim to contribute to ensuring availability and equal access for women to diagnostics and to treatment. Um, we also aim to promote universal health coverage 
through equitable access to essential services and information, including sexual and reproductive health, maternal care, and also uh, to increasing the capacity to address both communicable and non-communicable diseases. In other words, uh, the EU is very much stepping up its support for the protection of the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women and girls, including access to services and information. And this, of course, includes very much HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment. Um, of course, we also need to make sure that this is concretely also filtering down at ground, grassroots level, at the ground level. Uh, where action needs to happen ultimately. And at the country and regional level, we are developing a number of Team Europe initiatives to scale up our impact. And Team Europe initiatives are an integral part of our multi-annual programs. And through these Team Europe initiatives, we work jointly with EU member states in our partner countries to further identify gender objectives uh, in all of them. And you know, just to give a couple of quick examples, um, we have, for example, the work being carried out in Zimbabwe on gender equality through women's empowerment, and also uh, projects underway in, in, in Sudan on women's rights, and many, many other examples. Um, together with a number of member states, we're also designing currently a, a regional Team Europe initiative on sexual and reproductive health and rights for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, another example I could give of EU action on the ground is uh, the call of which, in which we have invested over 30 million euros for proposals on promoting universal SRHR of vulnerable adolescents in Africa. Uh, and through this call, we are finalizing the selection of project proposals that would contribute to countries reaching universal health coverage for universal sexual and reproductive health and rights for adolescents in Africa, especially adolescent girls and other vulnerable adolescents. Of course, we continue very much to support initiatives at global level as well. In addition to all of this, I, I here would like to emphasize uh, the support we continue to give and will continue to give to key global initiatives, such as the Global Fund to, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, and also to UN FPA supplies. Many examples, but as you can see, concretely on the ground at all levels. Thank you. Thank you. So pleasant to be hearing um, sexual health and rights advice that the EU is working on that. And there's this thing um, um, that we used to say as young, um, as young leaders in the sexual health and rights and response that sexual health and rights and rights is a bedrock of um, equality and it's exciting that the EU is working on that, particularly for women and girls in Africa. My next question will be going to Diane. Diane, the Global Fund has been a game changer when it comes to fighting hate, TB and malaria, taking new technologies to scale. It is clear that the AIDS epidemic remains a global health threat. Recognizing the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and the threat of future pandemics, how do we maintain focus to end hits by 2030? Thank you, Iwatuchu, for that question. And, and uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, indeed, the uh, setbacks in the fight against uh, AIDS globally have been rather terrifying in the last uh, two years. As uh, many of the other panelists have indicated, uh, the, the setbacks go across the board um, in all of the incredible progress that we had made on AIDS over the last 40 years. And in particular, um, since the Global Fund started investing at scale 20 years ago, we've seen reversals across all key programmatic results. Um, really the, the effect of COVID-19 across the board and particularly on HIV prevention um, is alarming. And we're going to have to work um, as, a, as a community to address this. In fact, the HIV community has done a remarkable job uh, in sustaining continuity of treatment in particular for antiretroviral therapy. And in all the countries where the Global Fund uh, 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 works, uh, we've seen incredible efforts to sustain access to treatment. But the prevention programs, and especially those um, for the most vulnerable groups that people have been talking about, have been badly affected. 
And indeed, as we sit here today, we see um, a resurgence, a fourth wave um, of COVID-19 across the globe. Um, so our struggle is far from over in trying to mitigate the effects of the COVID pandemic um, on HIV. We've seen um, not only interruptions in prevention programs, many young people were not in school for long periods of time. Some young girls may not get back to school. And those are some of the key areas where, as we've been talking um, about sexual and reproductive health and rights, comprehensive sexuality education, these kinds of things happen in school environments or in, um, in activities that surround um, school going young people. So we really have um, a huge amount of work to make sure that the resources um, and the leadership that has been in some cases diverted to deal with the COVID crisis, um, come back and, and reinvest in the work we need to do um, on HIV. So the Global Fund is doing a lot um, to try and mitigate this. Just in the last year, we've deployed um, 4 billion additional dollars um, to mitigate the effect of COVID-19. And a lot of that is targeted um, to COVID, but, but a, a lot of the investments are also targeted to the mitigation on, on HIV. Um, and some of the examples are um, uh, in the direct areas that many other panelists have discussed today. So for example, there's a lot of direct investments in preventing gender-based violence. And I think we all agree that we saw a spike in that during the COVID pandemic and during the lockdowns. Um, so we've made additional specific investments in prevention of gender-based violence and in services around that. Um, and that's in addition to the investments we're making also as part of this additional investment this year in addressing gender and human rights related barriers to access to treatment. So some of those are some of the specific uh, mitigation me measures we're putting in place for COVID-19 um, during this current uh, crisis. Um, we are also, as part of our outreach to donors, making sure, um, and the European Commission is, is one of the biggest ones, and I was very pleased to, to hear um, such a focus on HIV and particularly gender and, and vulnerable communities investments from the Commission today. Um, we're having that conversation with donors that we must maintain the focus on ending AIDS by 2030. Only with that sustained and increased funding over um, the next nine years, will we get back on track um, to really make um, the, the, the progress that we've made over the last 40 years mean um, something uh, for those 2030 uh, goals that we're looking at. So we, in our immediate term, we think we need to do more to address the COVID-19 crisis, because although we've been able to mitigate something over the last two years, we know, and we heard from Sibongile, for example, that many of the community services have not been able to come back from this crisis. Um, we're finding that um, when clinics reopened, half of them are not able to function. So we do need to do more um, to invest in this COVID crisis in the next year um, so that we can uh, address the pandemic at its, uh, in the countries where we work. Um, and get back to delivering on the aspects of HIV prevention and treatment that we know are needed. But longer term, we have to look at the, the uh, investments in all of the international, regional and, um, and community services that are going to be needed. And for that, um, we really count on the support of everyone here for the global funds um, replenishment that we will be working on in 2022. Um, in fact, the EC has a tradition of announcing an early and increased pledge that very much sets the tone for our replenishment. They've done it um, for the fifth and the sixth replenishment. And we're very much hoping that we can work together um, to make that happen um, next year as well. Because there's no doubt that um, we will need more resources for HIV. So the Global Fund six replenishment that raised $14 billion, incredibly successful, but even if we, in, we were to invest an additional 14 billion, that will not help us catch up from this terrible setback of the last two years. Um, so we're, we're pretty sure we're going to need um, more money for that. And whatever money we uh, raise will um, really be a game changer for HIV AIDS, right? 50% of what the Global Fund spends every year um, and will spend in the future goes uh, to the um, HIV AIDS response in countries. And even um, as we try and invest more in um, TB and malaria as we go forward, we know that um, 
HIV still gets the lion's share of all of those allocations. Um, and in fact, um, the Global Fund's um, future direction um, is dependent on us beating um, the pandemics of AIDS, TB, and malaria. So we're very invested in continuing to do our work. Um, I'll leave it th um, there for now. Thank you, Iwatutu. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, uh, I, 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 allow me to paraphrase um, Violetta Rose of the um, UNSPCB during the funding dialogue. And she was saying that um, laws and policies are not as, as much as good when there's funding for it. And um, looking at the context of COVID-19, it reflects that um, funding is very important um, because of um, the effects of COVID-19 on um, destruction of um, economic women and girls. Uh, some of them are not able to go back to school, like you said. And you also said the remarkable work that the community of um, HIV has done. Now, I'm going to be asking Sibon Hele that um, the lessons, what are the lessons we've learned from the AIDS response that can be used to address COVID-19? What we have learned, um, we have learned that working together, we can, we can make it. One, we have learned that community voice is very important uh, from the HIV era where communities stood up and voice out to say we need treatment and learn from other uh, colleagues or countries to say how are they doing it and also use the, 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 the existing laws to fight uh, inequality and also to fight uh, non, uh, gov the government that doesn't want to respond. We know what TAC did in South Africa in order to fight for ARVs and we continue to fight. What we can learn is that uh, for, 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 for us to end AIDS and for us to address issues of COVID-19, we need to work together. We are talking about trips waiver uh, now, which are, are preventing uh, 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 some progress on fighting of, of COVID-19, which other countries, which are poor countries who cannot afford to buy country um, uh, vaccines are unable to do that because of the greediness of other governments. So we have learned that learning from each other, supporting from each other, we are able, we're able to, to, to be where we are. Yes, we haven't won the fight against HIV, but at least today we are talking about a successes and the progress that we have made, although we have challenges. But when we want to fight COVID-19, we need to continue the same trend. But let us not forget the community voice. Let us not forget all the players that are important, but mostly importantly, education information to communities because communities are the ones who understand what are their needs, what is needed on the ground and how to deal with challenges. We are in the community, we know our areas best, we know our challenges best and we know how to get solutions but we need support in order to get that. So with HIV, we were able to fight stigma and discrimination, we were able to fight for treatment to be available uh, for everyone. Uh, we, were, we, uh, we were able to, 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 to be able to speak out on the issues of, of HIV. So even with COVID, we can do that, but we need to work together. We need a, 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 a governments who are able to make vaccines to allow other governments to make vaccines uh, like Africa to, make, to be able to, to, to manufacture their own vaccines, to, to have more vaccines and cheap at a cheaper price where everyone might be able to get a, a, a a vaccine. So I believe that we can win uh, the fight against COVID like we did, uh, like we are doing in, in, in fighting HIV. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You said community voices and what I can pick up in uh, what community voices is saying is that we need to work together. We need to work together, not only to address HIV, but also pick up best practices, some of the uh, effective flourishing and cost-effective um, programs that we have done us, um, uh, around HIV and use it to address COVID-19. Because we work together um, around in the HIV response to make sure that there's no stigma, there's no discrimination, and why there are still existing challenges, we can also pick some of those best practices and successful programs and use it in addressing COVID-19. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question will be going
going to Joyce, and Joyce as part of the community, I want to ask you that knowing that there are millions of girls and young women living with HIV and seeing the increasing complexity of the global health agenda, how do we make sure that um, young women are not left behind? I thank you very much for that question, Joyce, and uh, thank you to Sibo for bringing out some of the key issues that I actually wanted to talk about, um, about the community-led responses and um, the important role that the communities continue to play in the, uh, in the HIV response. Um, indeed, those are really shocking statistics. I mean, 2.1 million only adolescent girls and young women is quite worrying. And my heart weeps that after all these years, after, um, after four decades, um, we haven't scored that well in addressing the issues of adolescent girls and young women. What is even more heartbreaking is that all these cases could have been avoided, as uh, the people from UNAIDS have rightfully mentioned. And one thing that also keeps worrying me as an advocate is that um, the health agenda is continuing to get complex and complex day by day, and we are constantly replacing priorities. And as of now, HIV has been pushed um, under the beds and under, under the rugs, and now we are focusing on the new kid on the block that is COVID-19. But I'm happy that we're having this conversation now, probably because um, Wild AIDS Day is close by, but also because for us as people living with HIV, every day, um, is Wild AIDS Day. There is no specific day for us to remember the departed. There is no specific day for us even to live without fearing that, you know, you might not have medication in the next day. And that is the current situation in my country. We have a lot of issues with stockouts and, and with reagents for viral load testing. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, how to make sure that young women are not left behind. We need to really be strategic in engaging young women. We need to be very intentional in our efforts and we need to start doing things differently for young women. One of the things that we need to do is that we need to ethically and meaningfully engage young women in all processes. We need to let the young women lead the process from the inception um, of the programs to the design, to the implementation, to the evaluation at all at all stages, not just letting women to come in at the last minute to rubber stamp the processes. We know what works well for us. And I think Sibu really talked to this. And as young women, we have always wanted to be on board from the beginning, except we are always constantly left behind. And since everyone else is sharing their commitments, as young women, we are also putting out there our commitment to, um, to, end, HIV, uh, to end AIDS by 2030, just like everyone else. And we are ready to get on board. The other issue is the other thing we need to do is that we need to support youth-led organizations and network to lead the youth programming in HIV. Again, this builds up to my previous point about young people knowing um, where the shoe actually, um, how the shoe fits and where it doesn't. So we need to continue investing directly um, in direct funding streams for young people like the Have Voice Fund um, by the Global Fund. I think this is one of the excellent models of direct funding to the community, direct funding to the young people that has actually invested in capacity building the young women themselves and in capacity building the young women led organizations to enable them to be eligible for some of these um, complex, complex and um, stringent funding opportunities that are there. So I believe that if we all continue to be more flexible and support the critical and essential work, the young women led and young women based organizations are doing, then this would push us closer to eliminating um, the, the epidemic. And also we need to provide more platforms for young women leaders in decision-making spaces. And as we have continuously said, there is nothing for us without us and young women are ready to take up these spaces. So we need to continue to provide these platforms, especially in decision-making um, arenas. And finally, we need to continue to empower young women to take up leadership. As I mentioned earlier on, um, I am where I am today because I have received support from um, other, young, other, other women in the field, from other young women in the field through mentorship, through uh, youth-based and youth-led organizations that have supported me through this journey. And I believe that every young woman has the capacity and has the, the potential to become a leader if only they are mentored and empowered to take up these spaces. And lastly, I joined the other previous speakers in saying that we must work closely together with the affected communities to end AIDS by 2030. And we do not need to continue leaving the young women behind in the HIV response. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I'm just going to say this, that um, in a world of innovation, who, um, who are we supposed to trust more with um, innovative programs? And I'm going to say young people, young women. And yeah, you've mentioned that. Thank you very much. My next question will be going to Evelyn. Evelyn, you spoke about inequalities. What can the, par what can the parliament do to further social justice? Thank you so much. So Joyce says it already right now, and we in the European Parliament are pushing the same thing. Empower, 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 especially young women. Uh, and uh, of course, showing solidarity, listening. I mean, that, that doesn't sound very spectacular, but if you really apply that and do something for that, uh, then it's a lot of work. Um, already mentioned a couple of times, pandemic has increased the mental health issues. We're talking about loneliness. We are talking about getting even more marginalized, getting poorer. I mean, all in your daily concerns. So somehow there is a lot of everyday questions in that that make it simply easier for people uh, 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 having HIV. So many LGBTIQ people have already been isolated before. We know all that story. And uh, because the social contacts are often broken through their outing and the stigmatization, and then there comes Corona, and the whole thing is even uh, getting worse. So somehow we just can imagine in a situation where we think uh, as members of the society living in a comparatively uh, comfortable situation that everything that is getting more difficult with us in our lives right now gets double, triple, four, five, six, uh, five times uh, when you're just... Uh, 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 being a transgender person, having HIV, I mean, what, what, what should I add? So simply imagine all that. And therefore, we in the European Parliament, what we are looking at very carefully. One thing is always, I mean, I am a lawyer, but it's not only being about, uh, about being a lawyer, it's about looking very carefully in legal systems. So somehow there is so many structural uh, discrimination in legal systems. So what we have to do is... Uh, 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 being confronted in, even with those either outdated or newly made laws that criminalize women and girls instead of helping them. So the legislative work in member states is thus crucial. And when it is happening, I mean, or not happening in the member states, we in the European Parliament look at it because so many states who don't want to do something exactly on that, they always say it's a question of subsidiarity. And I just can assure you, we in the European Parliament the FAM committee, but uh, somehow also other committees, the plenary, we're pushing and saying, no, it's not a question of subsidiarity when you're dealing with really substantial uh, 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 fundamental rights, when you just have to uh, uh, help. I mean, really, uh, people against discrimination, this is one of our duties enshrined in the Article 2.3 of the European Union's treaty. So there is a task of the European Parliament to raise the voice and to look at those uh, discriminatory uh, uh, national legislation. So also repeal and modernize outdated laws that criminalize HIV transmission. So when looking into that, one can discover still, still quite, uh, quite a lot. And I think that is the task of us in the European Parliament to tackle that. I would like to raise one more issue, training. Training uh, for members of law enforcement, criminal justice system, healthcare providers, and media. I mean, it is so often mentioned, but here has to be a, a sort of a mainstreaming of uh, this uh, uh, sort of blindness uh, concerning uh, uh, concerning all those uh, marginalized. And insofar, I think the, the training uh, uh, aspect is one one that has to be included. We are looking at that carefully at the European Union level. But of course, there we need always the, 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 the support, the uh, more or less the, the good cooperation, the close cooperation at the national, at the community level. And with this, I come to my last point, community level. You've mentioned it already. Uh, I mean, without, uh, I mean, if we are sitting here in the European Parliament and talking to NGOs and uh, talking to uh, 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 UN and talking to all those important players, this is very important, but the real work is done at the community level. So we have, for example, in the European Parliament, an intergroup, the LGBTI plus uh, intergroup, which is very active and is really not only looking, but uh, having for, for close contact, but really going to the member states, going with all those uh, representatives, talking to the communities. And I think what is the utmost work 
everything that we can do also with the money we are directing in order to do all what I just said right now and monitoring and, and, and so on, that we are working very closely, sometimes directly with all those uh, uh, organizations and not only um, with, uh, the, with the member states' governments, because sometimes they, if they don't want to do something, they don't take the European money, even if it's dedicated. So sometimes we even have to, to be tough on that. And with this, I say thanks for giving me uh, right now the time for a long answer. Yeah, thank you very much, Evelyn. So I will just go rise in asking Dan this question, but I want to remind us that we are falling behind schedule. So I want the answers, please, the answer should be as um, quick as um, possible so we are able to meet our time. So um, Dehan, the, the UN is already updating its monitoring tool to reflect the global health targets. How will the global fund support, support countries to reach them? Um, thanks, Iwetuji. Yeah, so um, I think the, the key issues um, that the Global Fund will be supporting are, are sort of in the, in the short term because um, we, and in the longer term, in the short term, I think we have to double down on some of the things we've learned over the last two years during COVID to try and um, catch up uh, with the, the progress that, that we should be making against HIV. One of these is the deployment and uptake of innovations. Um, one of the things COVID has taught us is that we are actually capable of quickly implementing innovations. Um, and those of you who've been at this for a while will recall it took us over five years to develop a rapid test for HIV. Um, in COVID, we developed a rapid test in less than six months. So we think we need to invest more in, in developing, approving new tools to fight HIV and to get access to those um, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, Many people have already talked about the power of communities. So obviously we um, are already investing in scaling up a lot of community-led interventions, but we think both community-led interventions and community-led monitoring are absolutely crucial um, for the success uh, of, um, of, those, uh, of really reaching those targets. Um, and then I want to talk just a little bit about the new strategy that the Global Fund approved um, last week. So this is our new strategy from 2023 to 2028. So it is um, uh, crucially important for the achieving of the UNAIDS targets. And of course, it's very closely aligned with UNAIDS strategy. So looking to much more strongly address health inequities and in particular gender and human, uh, gender inequities and human rights barriers that many um, other panelists have talked about. I won't go into that. But of course, it's really, really important that we need to fund those interventions, right? We know what we need to do, but we haven't scaled them and had sufficient funding. And so maybe um, just to be brief, um, the most important thing from our point of view is that we're going to need the financing to be able to do all of those things, put communities at the center and address the barriers to, to really scaling up uh, HIV prevention um, and treatment activities. And so a robust seventh replenishment for the Global Fund will be able to fund that strategy and can greatly contribute to, to meeting those UNAIDS targets. Thank you. Thank you, Dehan. Financing and... Um, Scaling up, um, and scaling up support for community-led response is important to address these issues. And I'll be asking uh, Martin. Martin, we've already heard about the critical role of the 1010 targets to address societal barriers for an effective his response. These are closely aligned with EU values. How can the Commission play a leadership role in positioning the 1010 targets in its international development cooperation agenda to end? is by 2030. Yes, thank you. Um, and so in line with the 2021 uh, political declaration on HIV and AIDS and the global uh, AIDS strategy and the 1010 targets, uh, we are fully committed as EU to uh, three major objectives. First, to work towards ending the inequalities that fundamentally drive the AIDS epidemic. Secondly, to prioritize those people who are not yet accessing or not yet able to access life-saving HIV services, and here I would particularly emphasize girls and young women. Uh, and the third objective is, of course, to get back on track to end AIDS by 2030. So 
to do so, um, we need to continue our focus on tackling inequalities and ensuring gender equality and the protection of human rights in general. And to do this, we need to place people at the center. We need, as has already been said, to support community-led initiatives. And this is something I would like to emphasize, and it will be even more relevant in the world, you know, as we gradually get into the post-COVID scenario, we need to invest strongly in building sustainable health systems, learning from the COVID crisis. Indeed, uh, many would argue that the COVID crisis happened because our health systems, even those who thought they were robust, were not sufficiently robust, let alone all the others. Um, so central to our approach in, to ending AIDS is tackling of inequalities. And this would enable us also to be better prepared to tackle COVID-19 or any other future pandemic, uh, because very often the root causes of inequalities are, are the same. Um, and you, know, you, can, you, you can achieve multiple benefits by tackling the same core problem. Now, Commissioner Urpilainen has, uh, as you know, committed to making the reduction of inequalities as an overarching objective of our development cooperation. Uh, and she has set the objective of fighting inequalities by building inclusive and sustainable societies. And certainly we are very much committed to working with our partner countries to achieve this. And concretely, what this means in practice is that we need to mainstream the reduction of inequalities throughout the EU program and the project cycle. It means also addressing inequalities through Team Europe initiatives. It's not just a question of money. It's also a question of the expertise that Team Europe can provide. So we can have a larger impact. And it means implementing equality flagship initiatives in partner countries where inequality is a political, the fight against inequalities is a political priority. Of course, we will need to do so together with our partner countries. Now, uh, the Indiki Global Europe financial instrument stipulates that at least 20%, at least 20% will focus on human development. And this includes health and SRHR. And 85%, 85% of all the new external actions of the EU have to contribute to gender equality and women's empowerment. And I think the figure speaks for itself. 85% means practically everything has to be designed with this in mind. Uh, through the 2020-24 action plan on human rights and democracy, uh, the EU has reaffirmed its commitment to promoting and protecting these values worldwide. Uh, and as part of the country programming, as you know, we very much implement a country focused approach. All of our delegations have to submit a human rights and democracy country strategy, which is then agreed upon with the member states of the EU. And these strategies will explain um, the priorities for the next programming period and how to address these you know, through a variety of means, dialogues, funding, projects. Now, these strategies are, of course, still very much in the design stage. Uh, they are in the making, but they certainly have the potential to help mitigate some of the barriers, including legal barriers and others that still limit access to HIV services. Um, I'd like to emphasize the strengthening of, of health systems. This has to be really a core objective of the Commission's bilateral involvement in the health sector uh, if we are to achieve universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that advancing towards the end of AIDS will involve integrating further HIV services within a basic package of, of, of basic services, health services, ending inequalities and driving uh, multi-sectorial action. I mean, uh, we are currently supporting health programs across 34 countries um, with, you know, in 21 countries, there will be a strong emphasis on, on health system strengthening. Um, clearly, um, investing in health system strengthening means that we will be investing in key pillars that are essential for ensuring universal access to healthcare. Um, having strong health systems is not just about having the right medicines and personnel. It also means having the data, the domestic resources, the leadership, the governance structures to set up the right policies to ensure that the 10, 10, 10 targets are not only met, but are sustained and can be sustained in the long run. So um, we are very much working towards achieving these targets, uh, not 
on our own, but certainly together and jointly with our member states through Team Europe, as I mentioned. And also as a board member of the Global Fund, the Commission has continuously advocated and will continue to advocate for a strong focus on vulnerable populations and on addressing the various barriers, including legal barriers that still hinder and block access to HIV services. So work continues, but of course, lots more needs to be done, but we are definitely committed to that agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, Martin. I love the three objectives you mentioned, working towards ending inequality, prioritizing access to HIV services, and making sure we get back on track to end AIDS by 2030. My last question will be going to Hefrim. Ephraim, as UNS is leading the global effort to end his as a public health threat by 2030 as part of the Sustainable Development Goals, Ephraim, what's your call for action? Thanks to, to Joyce um, for that question. And thanks to all of the fellow uh, panelists that we've had in this conversation. There's so much to refer to from their own very wise comments. But my call to action, it's funny, actually, because when we adopted the Sustainable Development Goals uh, five, six years ago, SDG 10 was considered the orphan target. Today, it has many custodians, and we're happy for this. So my first call to action is, of course, to help us in closing the inequalities. The inequalities that we have within the response, they are completely within our power to close. And then the inequalities which affect the response, they're tougher, but we need to, we need to beat them too. And so that's my first call. And I think that we have our work cut out for us. We know that it implies making rights and voice count for all also closing uh, and making sure that our services and systems works for all, uh, such as Diane referred to making scientific progress, uh, uh, that, it, that everyone is entitled to enjoy it, that needs it. And I think uh, it's also about finding ways, pathways for sustainable financing of the response as well. Um, and, um, and of course, generating data for impact, as we've said. So that's my first call to action. My second one, because of EU's uh, leadership and together with many other countries on pandemic preparedness, is to say that the HIV infrastructure in many contexts is the backbone of pandemic preparedness. <laughs> and so investing in HIV yields far beyond it uh, in pandemic preparedness. If you care about rights, a human rights-based approach, if you care about inclusive governance, if you, care, if you care about the principles of equity. And so think about that as you also uh, explore and grow your role in pandemic preparedness, whether it's a legal instrument or a financial one, uh, this is our strong, strong, strong recommendation. And to honor those principles, even when it's tough, when it comes to access to medicines, we know that this is difficult, but it makes sense, uh, not only morally, but actually also economically for a quick recovery. Of, of the global economy, which I think that taxpayers around the world is what they are expecting when they've invested so heavily in all of these solutions that we have currently for COVID-19. And so continue to grow and explore your role politically, financially, and technically in the HIV response, because it's uh, important in and of itself as we listen to in this panel, because, but also because of the wider benefits that it has for global health, pandemic preparedness, but actually development work overall. And also, if you can, explore your possibility of supporting UNAIDS. UNAIDS is often the first responder and the last agency standing with many of these communities that we care so much about, and they're often the most, the, the furthest left behind. And so thank you so much for convening this uh, important event. And um, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ephraim. It's such a great pleasure to have um, all the panelists here um, giving us such a rich and insightful discussion and sharing some of your experiences with us, particularly the important roles you play in the by 2030. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Hanto. Thank you, um, Iwatutu and all of the panelists. We, to respect everyone's time, I'm conscious that we have just one minute to wrap up. That was such a rich discussion. And I just wanted to share some key things that came out of it. And then I'm going to hand over um, to, um, to, to, to close up the event. 
Um, of all of the different events, uh, sorry, of all of the different points that came out, what's really clear is that the EU is committed to ending inequalities that drive the AIDS epidemic. Um, and that it has appropriate policy frameworks in place to ensure mainstreaming of gender equality and equal access to health, um, as we have heard from many of the EU representatives. The policy frameworks are important for operationalizing commitments and to make sure that action takes place at every country level. Um, and we've seen some comments in the chat around the importance that the EU can play um, and its representatives can play at a country level to, to promote those frameworks. HIV communities are seriously affected by COVID-19. And, and what's been des described in the, in the discussion is the need to step up investments in, to, to end inequalities um, so that we can end AIDS. As such, an early um, and increased pledge to the Global Fund will be critical to regain the lost ground on HIV, but also, the, as we've heard, the Global Fund's been playing a critical role in supporting the country-level responses to COVID-19. Um, and this is essential if we're not, if the AIDS response is not to be pushed even further off, off track. The integration of HIV, we've heard in the discussion uh, with SRH, human rights and gender equality and education are essential, particularly focusing on vulnerable marginalized communities such as girls, young women, LGBT communities, and other key populations. And finally, what's been really important to hear in this discussion is that the EU recognizes the critical role of communities in being the driving force in fighting AIDS and, and, and ending the epidemic going forward. We need, as we've heard from this discussion, strong community voices, strong community-led responses for people-centered approaches. And we need more leadership like the great um, um, colleagues and panelists on this panel um, to ensure that vulnerable populations um, 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 needs are addressed. So hugely, huge thanks to, to Ifrem, to Diane, to, to Sibongile, Evelyn, Martin, and Joyce for, um, for taking part in this panel. It's been a really, really rich discussion. Um, and what I'd like to do is hand the floor over to Director General Ambassador Igor Jugic um, for closing the event. And once again, thanking the Slovenian Presidency of the Council for being the official host of this event. We've been really grateful. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with you all. Um, so, Last not least, to thank to thank um, the presidency, Slovenian presidency for the council, um, and to hand over to you, um, Igor, for to close this event formally. Thank you, thank you, Anton, uh, and, uh, dear colleagues and uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, it's my honor, you know, to uh, to have a concluding remarks at the tail ends of uh, this uh, um, uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, let me just pass a few, few messages, not to drag on uh, with, with, with the long speech, you know, I, I would just like to commend UNAIDS uh, for the 25 years of dedicated and groundbreaking work. Uh, a lot has been accomplished, but there are still uh, nearly 38 million people living with HIV. Uh, on top of that, we are facing another global health threat and things are not uh, moving well in this regard uh, that also has impact on our AIDS response. Uh, deep inequalities between uh, and within societies are now further worsening because of the COVID pandemic. And uh, many further existing challenges such as uh, gender inequality, uh, sexual and uh, gender-based violence, stigma and discrimination and access to basic social services uh, are now becoming even greater. Uh, and uh, tackling inequalities is uh, central to ending its pandemic. In uh, 2020, 62% of all new infections were in uh, vulnerable and marginalized population. And uh, there are uh, counting uh, thousands uh, every, every week. Uh, Thousands of girls and young women become infected with HIV, the majority of them in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, there is no doubt we need an AIDS response that would support those uh, who are uh, still or always left behind. Uh, in the context of a global health, uh, my country, Slovenia, support the leading role of the European Union by uh, advocating uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach, including civil society and private sector. That's a very important element. And uh, we remain committed to strengthen uh, resilience. 
Um, global solidarity is a key to success to defeat the pandemic and uh, global diseases and uh, our duties to step in. Uh, our advocacy is uh, complemented by actions on a bilateral level. I will not go into details here, uh, uh, but we are supporting uh, several activities to strengthen health systems, including in uh, those in Afghanistan, uh, implemented by Slovenia organization ITF, enhancing uh, human security. Uh, just a few words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the path to AIDS-free world leads through addressing the root causes of poverty and inequalities, which remain the main cause of sp spreading AIDS and other pandemics. So we need to protect the right to health for all without ex exceptions, and we cannot afford not to. And I would uh, thank you for your contribution and for your uh, wise uh, guidance throughout the session and uh, thank you very much. Thank you everybody and um, and enjoy the rest of the days. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.